A very warm good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Good evening, viewers. I'm Matthias Ofiku, news editor of the Namibian Sun newspaper. Welcome to another exciting edition of the Evening Review Show. Tonight, we're joined in studio by Honorable Henny Sebeb, the deputy leader of the Landless People's Movement, also the chief whip of the party in the National Assembly. Good evening and welcome, sir. Good evening. Thanks for having me here. No, it's always a pleasure to have you here. Well, let's get right into business. You had a press conference earlier today. Um, can you just give us a summary of uh, the key points of that press and what necessitated this press conference? Yeah, no, I, I had a press conference, as you ri uh, rightly mentioned it. Uh, we were looking at the farm evictions uh, of the Acacia farm that has been given, uh, trying to remove the marginalized home community once again from the farmland. And also we look at the University of Namibia postgraduate courses, mm -hmm. more especially as it pertains to the master's in public administration degree. Mm -hmm. We also look at the accumulation of our resources, uh, Namdia and uh, Bidu Gold, uh, in solidarity with the striking workforce there at Bidu Gold. And uh, we also touch on uh, basically the general conditions mm -hmm. in Namibia as it pertains to natural resources and so on. So yeah. it was all-inclusive, short uh, press conference. <laughs> okay, yeah. Let, let's start with the land issue. Of course, it's a, founding, a key founding value of, of, of the party. Where, where are we getting it wrong 32 years later? We are still on this land topic. Where are we not getting it right? I, I, I think what we lack in Namibia is that we don't have a class agenda as far as the land redistribution is concerned in this country. Uh, who are going to be the intended beneficiaries? Uh, is it going to be the farm dwellers, the landless people in the urban periphery, uh, in the towns, and so on? So we don't have a clear-cut class agenda. And this leads us always of a void that the elites are the ones that are at the front to benefit from this. Mm -hmm. We are not even saying, look, let's look at the small scale commercial farmers, for example. Yeah. Are we going to look at the petty commodity traders? What do we want to achieve? Is it uh, for the agrarian reform at the end of the day? Or is it just a mere land redistribution? So we don't have a clear cut class agenda. What should be the size of these farms be? Uh, should we specialize into more horticultural producers? crop uh, production. So if we don't have a particular class agenda, we are going to come back to this question of the land reform 10, 20, 30 years from now on. Mm -hmm. With that said, and, and then balancing that with the current uh, resettlement policy that we have, of course, I know you've have, you have your reservations around that. H how do we attempt to then unite the two to, to give us an outcome that, that we feel as a society should serve us better? Look, we, we must decide. What do we want to do? You can have a land reform without agrarian reform. You can as well have an agrarian reform without land reform. So what we need to do is to ask the question, what is the specific class agenda that we want to pursue? Mm -hmm. Are we now saying let's have a certain class of a large-scale commercial farmers or large-scale farmers? Mm -hmm. Are we going to move into the trend of the medium-scale uh, farming? Or are we having a market-oriented, small-scale farming sector that we wish to pursue? Mm -hmm. And then from that, now, based on that, we need then to develop what we call an integrated rural development plan mm -hmm. that will accompany this. So the demarcation of the land, um, a particular inputs uh, that we need to have. For example, you must remember that large-scale commercial farms are not really an answer to the farming in Africa at large, many countries are looking and zeroing into small-scale farming, mm -hmm. especially the market-oriented small-scale farming, where you have the uh, where we talk about the rich peasants mm -hmm. or the uh, or, or just the petty commodity traders. And how do we 
respond to the overall question of the foods of Rendi in, 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 on this continent. So those are the basic questions that now the whole land movement or the revolution is moving towards. So we need to update ourselves and be speaking to the current uh, uh, discourse mm -hmm. that is going around. Yeah. Uh, therefore, we need to have much research that will be able to provide us sufficient answers. Yeah. You mentioned earlier on about uh, the issue of the elites having hijacked the process in a certain way. Um, of course, there, there are some aspects of, of this resettlement policy that, that has worked, but just not on a, on a bigger scale. So, and our problem over the years has really been the issue of good policies, but the implementation thereof, like you mentioned. So, with the, with the solutions that you are proposing, how do we then avoid a situation whereby, again, we have those who are tasked with making decisions, hijacking that very same process that's supposed to benefit the person on the ground? Exactly, that is a worry. How do we ensure that uh, the elites don't uh, form what we call a dominant class mm -hmm. and keep on empowering themselves? Mm -hmm. uh, if you compare them to the marginalized and the vulnerable groups, mm -hmm. such as the hate on people now. So once you have a strong uh, government institutions in the context of the land governance now, once you have strong institutions and officials that are trained to understand a particular class agenda, mm -hmm. uh, I, I think much of these problems will be lessened. The other issue is that whereas the vulnerable and the marginalized people and the landless uh, groups are complaining, the same officials mm -hmm. are keeping uh, uh, the door closed. They don't listen to, for example, the complaints, the governors, the regional governors that are there don't take up the people's issues very much. And then you have this cloud that the executive directors that are supposed to provide answers are part and parcel of the ruling elite in the context of their think tanks of the political parties mm -hmm. and so on. So when they meet at those platforms, they sit and design policies that are very much uh, not advantaging the poor mm -hmm. and the marginalized in this country. So once you assume power, what you need to do is to look at the institutions, get rid of the rotten apples, mm -hmm. and then start to say, look, this is what we want in the next five years. Mm -hmm. If you don't do that, your policies become corrupted, it becomes implementable, and it becomes a squabble ground. Mm -hmm. Now, the approach that you have is that we have a piecemeal sort of approach, uh, policies that we have. There is a problem, let's either push in money there, or let's uh, quickly settle maybe that community to other piece of land. Mm -hmm. But it's not durable, it's not sustainable, and it becomes very inefficient and very expensive in the long run. Yeah. Um, another issue that I'd like you to touch on is, is the issue of this one-size-fits-all approach that we tend to implement as far as uh, uh, public policies are concerned. And by this, what do I mean? You just mentioned other high -com. You can also mention mm -hmm. the sun the northeastern mm. area who are not uh, supposed to mm. live the way they naturally live because they can't hunt in the park. So these are some one-size-fits-all type of policies that we have adopted mm. over the years mm. instead of really zeroing in on specific solutions for specific communities. Well, what do you say? How should we approach this? Yeah, um, look, we have several property rights regimes in this country. You have the common access, the common the communal land or common pool resources. You have the private land and the state and so on. So now, you need then therefore to design a specific class agenda. How do you want to accommodate all in a short space of time? Five years, 10 years, so that then you can respond to their needs because people's needs will be different. Uh, in, in the land sector now that we are busy talking about, you will have specific farmers that wants to export their produce. So you need to design specific policies that are answerable to that. But then you also need to look at the food security. Mm -hmm. Subsidization, seeds, for example, seed industry is big. We don't have a huge set, uh, a seed factory or manufacturer in this country. Where does it go? Uh, uh, we rely most of the times on South Africa for that because they have got one of the world's biggest seed and fertilizer companies. Ah, just here. In, in South Africa. So our ministers of agriculture must speak to the others in such a way that we respond to 
the majority poor people. Because you can't have a condition that the 60% of the people are poor uh, and, and, and then you continue to go as if there was nothing going on in the country. So specific policies must be targeted to certain groups of people. Uh, let me give you an example. Uh, let's say MTC. There was a time that they were selling shares, I understand. So now the issue is now how do you ensure that a himba, that a son in a home also end up benefiting from those shares? Because mm. once you push shares on the public domain, even me who is earning a small salary now won't be able to afford. But what about the most marginalized in the society? So can't we buy for them shares as a group? That, that, those are the things that we must ask. If you divert now to the current issue of the Namdia, Mm -hmm. And the companies or, or, or the two business people that are said to have benefited. Mm -hmm. Why don't we say, for example, uh, let's take 100 youth, Kavango West, Kavango East. They are good in athletics and so on. Why don't we, instead of me earning at the end of the day uh, 23 million or 20 million mm -hmm. as part of the dividends, why don't we take those 100 youth, empower them, and then give them 1 million at the end of the day? each one of them. Now, how many youth will you empower as part of a larger group scheme at the end of the day? And that is what we must look at. This thing of evicting people mm -hmm. is becoming unsustainable. Where will those poor people go? They are born in Namibia. It was their land. Four triggers came, possessed their land. Mm -hmm. Later, Germans came. They took their land. And now it goes on. And the current government is also dispossessing these people from their own. Yeah. So we will keep on going in the circle. Mm -hmm. Hence, I'm saying let's have a clear-cut class agenda. Develop policies, what are the intended beneficiaries? Mm -hmm. And then we look at, uh, 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 if we put this group of people, what is the post-settlement support that we must mm -hmm. offer them? Should yeah. we allocate them with a 50,000 rents or 100,000 uh, Namibian dollars? Mm -hmm. Let's look at all those modalities. Yeah. Then we are going to have a durable plan mm -hmm. for all of us in this country. Yeah. You, you spoke about the solidarity economic approach. Can you mm -hmm. just break that down? Solidarity economy uh, approach is the one that was advocated by uh, Mazibugo Chaha. Mm -hmm. In South Africa, a few years ago, the Institute for Poverty, Land and Agrarian Studies had a land conference. So they commissioned uh, three academics. So this one was talking about the solidarity approach. That is now more left-leaning, mm -hmm. that looks at the landless workers, the urban dwellers, and so on, and say, look, unless we accommodate the bulk of the dispossessed, the ones that were living in bandu stands, mm -hmm. like our reserves here, if we don't accommodate them into the mainstream, small-scale agriculture, peasant farming, mm -hmm. rich peasant farming, petty commodity traders, mm -hmm. traders, then we are going to sit with the whole question of the land. So mm -hmm. some like the uh, uh, Fing and Kirsten mm -hmm. were proposing a, a, a large-scale farming as an option. The, the corporate agriculture, mm -hmm. uh, 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 the supermarketization of our countries and so on. So, and then the middle ground by Aliba, who was saying basically, look, let's look at the hybrid system, con uh, confining all of them. So whenever you have a talk about land, you need to commission papers. Mm -hmm. Let people come, conduct statistical, economical studies so that people are informed and, and better at the same time. So the solidarity economy by Mazibugo Jaha, mm -hmm. we are going to get him next year uh, from Cape Town so that he come and shares uh, his approach in terms of solving the land question mm -hmm. in Southern Africa yeah. and more especially in, in South Africa. Mm -hmm. Honorable we'll just head for a quick break and we'll come back to continue this insightful conversation. Thanks. To our viewers, we head for a quick commercial break and we'll be back to continue this conversation. Take a load off and tune into another episode of Brave Namibia as we take a look at both ordinary and extraordinary Namibians. Brave Namibia is broadcasted on NTV Saturdays at 6.30 p.m. and oneup2.com as well as broadcasted on the following Facebook platforms on Wednesday at 5.30 p.m. Republican, Algamina Titan, Namibian Sun, and all Namibia Media Holdings pages. 
For more information, contact the Brave team at brave at synergy.com.na. Brave Namibia, for the ordinary and extraordinary Namibians. NMH at One brings you news from all across Namibia. If you would like to feature your brand or campaign on this platform, contact NMH1 at synergy.com.na. NMH at One, your lunchtime news companion. Well, let me welcome our viewers back from the short break. Well, I will say, babe, we, we spoke at length about the land issue, of course, a burning issue in the country. Another issue is the, the issue of uh, resource distribution, equitable resource di distribution for that matter. You s you've touched on the issue of Namdia during your, your mm -hmm. press conference earlier today also. Wh what is the big issue, and I ask this again deliberately, that's blocking the equitable redistribution or distribution of resources in this country? Uh, again, as I said, especially if we refer now to the natural resources and the mineral resources in this country, is that there are basically two things. One was explained so nicely by David Harvey when he wrote a paper on accumulation by disposition, some Marxist uh, uh, interpretation of it. Look, uh, global capitalism is not going to fall back. It's increasing and it's at a very fast pace. So we find ourselves in that global conundrum. Mm -hmm. Now, the issue here at stake is that, look, we have a particular natural resources, mineral resources in this instance. Mm -hmm. And it seems to appear that apart from the global player like Namdep, there are now other small players with the some external uh, capital mm -hmm. that are at play, leaving out and denying the rest of the Namibians to benefit from our mineral resources. Mm -hmm. In this instance now, you heard that a certain Arab businessman came, mm -hmm. and that Arab businessman, even younger than me, came with nothing, and he is suddenly so rich. Mm -hmm. It was written in the newspapers, yeah. and, and that's where we are, I'm basing my analysis from. Mm -hmm. And then we have particular people born in, or probably after independence, mm -hmm. and that are suddenly super rich. And you wonder, on 22nd of March 2016, President Kengop said people shouldn't discuss any business at the State House. Now, you start to wonder, we are told this, but the people that are very close to him are the ones that are benefiting so much today from the resources, uh, judging from the diamond industry and other industries. Mm -hmm. uh, 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 some of the, the colleagues that are now uh, uh, big players are actually a product of that. So we want to know how Namdia and the others are doing their business. Why should only two people benefit? And it looks like a squabble now. Mm -hmm. Others have apparently name dropped, allegedly, and now they are angry. And then the Minister of Mines is in court. But the biggest question that we need to ask ourselves is, who are these players mm -hmm. that are involved in this industry now? Yeah. What, what sort of policies are there that will safeguard that the protest of all, or let me say the whole of all of us should mm -hmm. benefit as compared to two, three, four, five players? Yeah. And it's not only there. We know in the, um, in the build industry uh, there is a certain uh, a person that came from China with a bag, apparently, <laughs> and now she owns almost all the buildings, mm -hmm. uh, uh, the, so much to the extent that they call, they own the commanding heights mm -hmm. of our economy. <laughs> so what we are faced with is, how do we deal with that? Who is fitting their interests? Is there a particular class agenda? Mm -hmm. Is it just an accumulation yeah. uh, uh, by any sort in, in, in this country? Mm -hmm. So, and then, and, and then that's where the 
policy domain comes in. Mm -hmm. so, so, so some of the members of the public would argue that, uh, but uh, we send you, Honorable Sebe, to Parliament with your colleagues, mm -hmm. whether it's from other parties or so, to come mm -hmm. up with policies to safeguard our resources. Yes, and the difficulty is that I hope they will give us 64 seats <laughs> in the next round so that we can arrest some of the uh -huh. criminals in this country. Yeah. We will destroy the deep state that has been formed over the 32 years in this country. Uh -huh. We will dismantle all those uh, 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 side titles that have been built uh -huh. so that the people can begin to benefit. And we are not going to, to, to write policies in such a way that a governing party at that stage must be the only one to benefit. Mm -hmm. And that is a problem. Look at the Minerals Act. Look at the Fisheries Act, how they have destroyed. Uh, we, we are living like Gareth uh, Harden said in 1968, the tragedy of the commons. Mm -hmm. We are all suffering. Our sardines ran out, extinction. And most, most of these natural resources, uh, uh, our ecosystem is being depleted. Look at the Stambrid, uh, the, the, the Omaheke area, mm -hmm. where they allowed in situ leaching uranium mining. Mm -hmm. These things in some parts of the world aren't even allowed. But here we are destroying our uh, aquifer. Mm -hmm. And we depend so much on that aquifer for our crop production, uh, uh, cattle farming, and so on. Mm -hmm. So we don't think about the future generation mm -hmm. that is going to come. Yeah. We are all help and on. Let's get rich now at the expense of the other. And that is where the paper or the word strategy of the commons is emanating from. Mm -hmm. We are on a fast pace to exploit our resources. It's not good yeah. at all. Mm -hmm. How easy or difficult is it to, to, to propose ideas to the ruling party? And are, do you think are they are acceptable to good ideas? Do you think they'll implement it? Last year, we proposed two motions in Parliament. One was concerning the Negertal Dam. Mm -hmm. How do we use that 5,000 hectares for our agricultural purposes? Mm -hmm. You know, now the Ukraine-Russia war is on, or the Russia-Ukraine war is on. Mm -hmm. We have difficulties, shortage of the wheat, mm -hmm. the grain, and so on. So we were saying, let's develop Negertal Dam. Who blocked it? It was the very same swap. <laughs> uh, uh, and this year, we have two most progressive motions that we have, the write-off of the water debts and the write-off of the electricity debt. Mm -hmm. Apart from Namibian Sun only writing an article of 150 words, mm. it was well received so far in Parliament. Uh, our good friend, the uh, brother Utoni Njoma, mm -hmm. supported it. Uh, our sister Maureen Hinda also supported it. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Dienda, Elma Dienda. Mm -hmm. Uh, talk in favor of it. So, but then maybe the ruling will be made this week or next week. Mm -hmm. So we are going to wait and see. But, but and I underline uh, uh, the, the debts for the indigent citizens, the unemployed, and so on, should be written off, especially for water and electricity. It has been done in South Africa. Cape Town, I think, wrote mm -hmm. a uh, wrote off one point something, one point four billion rands uh, uh, last year, and so on. Even in the United States. We have been doing research. Several cities have programs that people actually enroll themselves and then they are assisted, especially when it comes to water. Mm -hmm. And then they write off water debt. So we are saying not for all. I mean, government offices, ministries and agencies still have to continue to pay. Mm -hmm. But for the most indigent, the vulnerable, the marginalized, the ones that are f fending to get something from the dustbins. We need to ease their burdens mm -hmm. and write off their water and electricity debt. So I hope uh, that uh, those two motions will be uh, endorsed uh, so that it goes to the parliamentary standing committees and then standing committees can travel to the regions and source more information, especially from our local authorities, because I'm sure they have uh, uh, ideas mm -hmm. on how it should be done. I know the mayors and the chairpersons for Ramohart and Karas regions, mm -hmm. they are also proposing few of some of the ideas. I know also the Association of Regional Councils in Namibia, they had such talks in their corridors. So this is something that all patriotic Namibians ought to support. Yeah. Lastly, um, we always complain about unemployment and so on. Um, 
But it, there, there has been a trend developing over the years. As, as soon as a certain development or proposed development comes to the country, there's this uprising and so on. How do we balance this in terms of, uh, of uh, sustainably utilizing our resources to fight the social vices such as unemployment? How do we go about this? Is there a way to go about it? It's, it's, it's a legitimate question uh, that needs uh, an honest approach. As, as you rightly put it, just by calculating our mineral resources and the oil discoveries and the gas discoveries that we are talking about, we ought to ensure that 2.6 million Namibians are better taken care of. We can do better. The problem here is that the chief policy makers and the executive that we had seems not to have a clear-cut vision. Mm -hmm. They don't implement policies to the end. There are too much of what we call revolving doors. Uh, you, you, you are a chief implementing officer of a policy, mm -hmm. yet you also want to put your hands in it. Yeah. So corruption, basically, mm -hmm. maladministration, uh, economic mismanagement, mm -hmm fiscal indiscipline, all these things come into play. Yeah. And then it becomes very difficult. We are supposed to be having the most efficient and effective administration mm -hmm. to work down and close all the gaps that exist uh, in, in the industry. Yeah. But it is such that we have wrong-headed people, people that don't sometimes understand, and the executive appointments, <laughs> you will believe that, hey, this person also becoming a minister yeah. or a deputy minister, it has become so readily accessible so that anyone mm -hmm. without even commensurate skills, expertise, talent can become an executive member <laughs> uh, in, in this country. It's, yeah. it's, it's a metric. It's, it's, it's so a laughing stock. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we, we are now depending on God mm. to carry us forward. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I don't know who else is going <laughs> to come down from heaven and yeah. help us except if it is not God or Jesus Christ. Robert <laughs> Sebeb, thank you very much for your time this evening. Thanks, yes. thanks, thanks That's very indeed much. good to have you in the studio and all the best. Thanks. Well, to our viewers, that's it from the Evening Review team this evening. Have a pleasant evening.